Chapter 20 covers nutrition and diabetes mellitus from Nutrition for Health and Healthcare 6th edition textbook by DeBrood and Penna. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to characterize type 1 and 2 diabetes and describe the complications associated with these conditions. Also be able to describe how diabetes is managed using individualized dietary adjustments, medications, and physical activity plans. Be able to explain how diabetes can affect long-term health, how gestational diabetes can affect pregnancy outcomes, and be able to describe the approaches used to maintain what's called glycemic control or blood sugar, blood sugar control in pregnant women with diabetes. Be able to identify the features and possible consequences of what's known as the metabolic syndrome and describe the current treatment approaches for this condition. In the United States, 12.3% of adults over the age of 20 are diagnosed with diabetes. This is about 29 million Americans. It is the seventh leading cause of death and it contributes to the development of other life-threatening diseases like heart disease and kidney failure. And in fact, uncontrolled diabetes is one of the most common causes of kidney failure. Poorly controlled and uncontrolled diabetes is detrimental to the human body. Diabetes mellitus describes a set of conditions in which the body experiences elevated blood glucose concentrations as well as disordered insulin metabolism. Elevated glucose, blood glucose concentrations are referred to as hyperglycemia, and they're the result of either the body's inability to produce enough of the hormone insulin to bring the blood sugar down, or due to the inability of the body's cells to use insulin effectively. Or you can have a combination of both, a little bit of both. Hyperglycemia refers to marked elevation in blood glucose levels. Your glucose should be in a range from about 60 milligrams per deciliter of blood to 110 milligrams per deciliter of blood. If it gets over about 110 and stays there, then it can cause damage to the blood vessel, nerves, and other tissues. It can cause tissue atrophy and can also result in amputations. I frequently saw amputations in the hospital as a result of people poorly controlling their blood sugars. And a lot of times it was patients who would come back and eventually they would not have one or both legs missing. So it's of the utmost importance to control blood sugar if you're somebody with diabetes mellitus. The symptoms of diabetes, the degree to which a person experiences symptoms is directly related to the degree of hyperglycemia present. 
Once blood glucose levels are above 200 milligrams per deciliter, which is high, this is excessive, this exceeds the kidney's thresholds. And at this point, glucose in the blood starts to spill over into the urine, resulting in a condition called glycosuria, or glucose in the urine. And that again occurs when the blood glucose levels rise above 200 milligrams per deciliter of blood. Table 20-1 from your textbook lists the symptoms of diabetes mellitus. Be familiar with them. They may include polyuria. Polyuria means excessive urine production, dehydration and dry mouth, excessive thirst, polydipsia, weight loss, excessive hunger, which is polyphagia, blurred vision, which can result from hyperosmolar fluids damaging sensitive eye tissue, increased infections as a result of increased glucose availability to bacteria, and fatigue. Diabetes is diagnosed based on the results of plasma glucose level testing. Glucose levels can be measured either under fasting condition or at random times during the day. If plasma glucose levels are measured at random times during the day, this is referred to as a casual blood glucose test. An oral glucose, glucose tolerance test can be used to diagnose diabetes and we'll talk about in detail what that involves. And also there's an indirect measure called glycated hemoglobin. It gives the value in a percent and indicates the percentage of hemoglobin that is attached to a glucose molecule. The longer your blood sugar stays elevated, the higher your HbA1c percent is. And we'll talk about some exact numbers for HbA1c values that are considered optimal. There are a number of ways to diagnose diabetes. The current diagnosis criteria includes the measurement of glucose after at least an eight hour fast or a random sample during the day. So if after an eight hour fast, plasma glucose concentration is greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter, then that is diagnostic or indicative of diabetes mellitus. If a random sample is taken or casual glucose level is taken during the day, whose reading is greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, along with the classic symptoms of hypoglycemia, then that is indicative of diabetes mellitus as well. Diabetes can also be diagnosed using the oral glucose tolerance test or the HbA1c percent level. The oral glucose tolerance test involves Given a subject 75 grams of glucose in a small dose or serving and measuring plasma glucose concentration. If the measurement is 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, then that is diagnostic of diabetes. If HbA1c percent level is measured and it's greater than 6.5 percent, that's indicative of diabetes as well. If people with prediabetes are usually asymptomatic, then why is it so important to pay attention to this disease? Why is it of concern? Well, one reason is that these people are at very high risk for developing type 2 diabetes. And there's some damage that can go on with um, elevated blood glucose levels even before a person is aware of symptoms. Some of this damage is irreversible. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the types of diabetes. We looked at the diagnostic criteria, which you should be familiar with. The main types include type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 is autoimmune and involves the autoimmune destruction of pancreatic beta cells. The pancreatic beta cells are responsible for producing the hormone insulin. 
Type 1 diabetes requires lifelong treatment with insulin. Type 2 diabetes is comprises 90 to 95% of diabetes cases. It is primarily a lifestyle and diet related disease. Poor eating habits and sedentary lifestyle contribute to the development of most cases of type 2 diabetes, most. With type 2 diabetes, a person's insulin receptors become less resistant to the action of the hormone insulin. With a person with gestation, gestational diabetes, this is a condition that occurs only during pregnancy. So only women get gestational diabetes. It's a condition in which this pregnancy is stressful and the mother is unable to control blood glucose as a result of physiologic stress from the pregnancy. It is of the utmost importance for a woman to control blood sugar. Insulin may be needed in some cases of gestational diabetes. The type of doctor that someone would see if they had diabetes, gestational diabetes would be an endocrinologist or a hormone doctor. The uh, progression of diabetes mellitus results in um, kidney failure and contributes to heart disease. Diabetes mellitus can result from medical conditions that damage the pancreas or that interfere with insulin function. Any condition in which the pancreas is damaged, one example would be cystic fibrosis. Table 20-2 summarizes quite nicely the features of both type 1 and type 2, the diabetes mellitus. Among the diabetic population, type 1 diabetes accounts for 5 to 10 percent of cases, while type 2 diabetes accounts for 90 to 95 percent of cases. Type 2 diabetes is associated with obesity, aging, and activity, and inherited factors. If your parents have type 2 diabetes or one of your parents have type 2 diabetes, you're more likely to have it. The major defect in type 2 is insulin resistance, where the cells are not sensitive to the action of the hormone insulin. So it produces an insulin deficiency relative to what the body needs. Insulin secretion type 2 diabetes may be normal, may be increased, or may be decreased. In some cases, insulin therapy is required. Some cases of type 2 diabetes, but all cases of type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes. or non-insulin dependent diabetes. That's, we don't call it that anymore. The incidence of, of type 2 diabetes is increasing among children and adolescents. And in more than 70% of cases in children and adolescents, diabetes development or type 2 diabetes development is associated with overweight or obesity and a family history of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is said to be harder to treat in young children, and it can be harder to detect. Physical activity and lifestyle changes are imperative. Imperative. With type 1 diabetes, pancreatic beta cell destruction occurs. The insulin has to be supplied exogenously, lifelong. It usually develops in children or teens or early adulthood, usually people under the age of 30. People are under the age of 30 when they're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The classic symptoms of type 1 diabetes include polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, and weakness or fatigue. This type 2 diabetes is the most prevalent form of diabetes. It 
involves insulin resistance of the body cells coupled with a relative insulin deficiency. And that is relative to what a person needs. Hyperinsulinemia occurs with type 2 diabetes, and this is abnormally high blood insulin. Hyperinsulinemia can damage nervous system cells. For example, your eye tissue can be damaged by hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia combined with hyperglycemia results in a lot of damage, okay, because we have hyperosmolar fluids that are usually less concentrated and they don't damage our tissues normally. So it's very important to control diabetes mellitus. If you know somebody, it is with diabetes that you, you know, want to get through to or, you know, um, they have to come to, to the decision themselves that they want to change. Um, one theory is that providing the background of how it connects, how health and food connects with disease development can help a person to initiate change. Obesity will substantially increase type 2 diabetes risk. 80% of people with type 2 diabetes are obese. 80%. And children and adolescents, risk factors for type 2 diabetes include, again, overweight and obesity, and family history of diabetes. Types 1 and 2 diabetes in children may be difficult to distinguish, so you know, it's harder to identify and treat. The prevention of type 2 diabetes mellitus is imperative. <clears throat> If you can't prevent it and you have type 2 diabetes, you can put it in remission, okay? Follow weight management guidelines and follow guidelines for diet modification. Start eating more regular balanced meals. With weight management, a sustained weight loss of about 7% of body weight is recommended for those individuals, 80% of individuals who are obese or if you're overweight. Dietary modifications include increasing your intakes of whole grains and dietary fibers. Dietary fibers help stabilize blood sugars. Decrease the amount of sugar-sweetened beverages and concentrated drinks you consume in a day. It is recommended that you consume less than 10% of your total calories from added sugars. <clears throat> also, decrease dietary fat if overweight or obese. Decrease the amount of fat you consume in your diet. And the types of fat you consume should be from healthful sources like fish and avocado, almonds, walnuts, oh, peanuts. Those are healthy type fats. Adopt a healthful lifestyle, an active lifestyle, to include at least 150 minutes of moderate physical activity every week. And it is important that type 2 um, diabetics are monitored regularly. Um, At-risk individuals are recommended to be monitored annually to uh, help prevent or intervene uh, before type 2 um, diabetes or pre-diabetes progresses to type 2 diabetes. Regular monitoring of blood sugar is imperative. Uh, once you get things under control and stabilized, you may be okay with checking your blood sugar once a day, but until things are normalized, you definitely need to be checking it way more than once a day. This flowchart is important to understanding the metabolic complications that occur in diabetes mellitus. This shows the effects of insulin insufficiency. There are a number, starting from the left, there is an increase in glycogen breakdown. 
Glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate and it breaks down into glucose. It goes into our bloodstream and as a result, we experience hyperglycemia. There are a number of uh, factors that contribute to hyperglycemia and insulin insufficiency. There's decreased glucose uptake by cells when the body does not respond to insulin or does not have enough insulin. The hyperglycemia that results from increased glycogen breakdown and the decrease in glucose uptake from cells results in glycosuria when blood sugar levels reach over 200 milligrams per deciliter. It exceeds the kidney's thresholds. Glycosuria promotes polyuria and dehydration. Glycosuria causes you to urinate more. And if you're feeling dehydrated, then you're going to be thirsty. Your body's going to respond with thirst or polydipsia, which is excessive thirst. Polyuria and hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia contribute to an increase in blood osmolarity or concentration. And this can damage our nervous system and can result in nervous system malfunction. Um, one of the things that can happen is damage to our sensitive eye tissue as a result of exposure to increased blood osmolarity. Insulin insufficiency affects our lipid and protein metabolism as well. In terms of lipids, the boxes in orange refer to the lipids. Um, there's an increase of triglyceride breakdown in the adipose tissues and there's decreased triglyceride synthesis in the adipose tissues. This contributes to an increase in fatty acids in the bloodstream, which contributes to an increase in fatty acid oxidation in the liver or breakdown of fatty acids in the liver. Fatty acids that are metabolized in the liver or oxidized in the liver contribute to ketone body production and ketone body production contributes to ketoacidosis. The decrease in triglyceride synthesis in adipose tissues can be what leads to weight loss in diabetes. There's increased protein breakdown and decreased synthesis of protein, which can lead to um, problems with immune system function or decreased immune function. Issues with protein breakdown and synthesis lead to muscle wasting and in those who are growing can stunt growth. An increase in Protein breakdown will contribute to the number of amino acids that are in the blood. If amino acids are in the blood in high amounts, the liver will respond by increasing glucose production. And as a result, that will aggravate hyperglycemia. Okay, let's look at the acute complications of diabetes mellitus. These are these complications that have a sudden onset. Diabetic ketoacidosis and type 1 diabetes is considered an acute complication. It is caused by the severe lack of insulin and is characterized by severe ketosis or abnormally high levels of ketone bodies in the bloodstream. Acidosis refers to a blood pH of less than 7.3 your body fluids like to be within a narrow range. Less than 7.3 is pushing it. Hyperglycemia arises. Usually blood glucose readings are greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter. So you can expect uh, polydipsia, polyuria, and symptoms. Other symptoms can include acetone breath, marked fatigue and lethargy, nausea, and vomiting. You can also experience blurred vision or blindness. And this is an emergency state. Diabetic ketoacidosis and type 1 diabetes can lead to an altered mental state. It can lead to a diabetic coma. Treatment involves insulin therapy. Uh, you might be put on an intravenous fluid insulin drip. Uh, you might also be given um, fluids for dehydration and electrolyte replacement. 
in some cases bicarbonate therapy may be necessary bicarbonate is a basic substance that can help uh, decrease the acidity of blood fluids okay while diabetic ketoacidosis is a symptom or complication of type 1 diabetes hyperosmolar hypoglycemic syndrome is often associated with type 2 diabetes with severe type 2 diabetes there's severe hyperglycemia and dehydration that develop in the absence of significant ketosis symptoms of the HHS in type 2 diabetes will include neurological abnormalities for example confusion speech impairment even seizures treatment includes intravenous fluid electrolyte replacement and insulin therapy and insulin can be given IV in an acute care setting hypoglycemia refers to low blood glucose we discussed hypoglycemia and type 1 diabetes it can lead to death in um, three to four percent of cases of type 1 diabetes that are in, being insulin treated it is often caused by an inappropriate management of diabetes excessive dosages of insulin or anti-diabetic drugs can contribute to hypoglycemia if you exercise too long you're going to run out of glycogen if you combine that with excess insulin then your blood sugar is going to drop dramatically skipping meals or delaying meals um, while still continuing insulin is um, going to cause hypoglycemia symptoms include sweating heart palpitations shakiness hunger hangriness weakness uh, lethargy treatment is with immediate administration of a glucose source in the form of juice candy or tablets over the long term diabetes mellitus results in chronic complications this is a result in part due to high levels of AGEs or advanced glycation end products advanced glycation end products refer to glycated hemoglobin these substances can result in altered protein structures and they can stimulate metabolic pathways that damage tissues the higher your blood sugar is the more advanced glycation end products you're going to have in your bloodstream an increase in levels of sorbitol can increase oxidative stress and damage cells macrovascular complications are considered chronic complications of diabetes mellitus specifically they refer to damage to large blood vessels in the body that can accelerate the development of atherosclerosis in the arteries of the heart brain and limbs atherosclerosis refers to the hardening of the arteries which can result in hypertension and cardiovascular diseases peripheral vascular disease is a macrovascular complication of diabetes mellitus someone with peripheral vascular disease may experience claudication which is pain due to decrease in circulation foot ulcers like the one pictured here can arise due to damage in part to the neurological system the neurological system when it becomes damaged in diabetes typically affects the peripheral nerves first if you have nerve damage you're likely to experience loss of sensation so you may not even be aware that there's a wound if you're not aware of a wound that wound is likely to get infected you still may not feel it um, you may not even detect it until it starts to smell so people with diabetes are, rec are encouraged to check their feet often 
gangrene can arise, this can um, necessitate amputations. Microvascular complications refer to those that damage small blood vessels or the capillaries. These results in retinopathy, which refers to weakened retinal capillaries that leak fluids, slippers, or blood and cause local edema or hemorrhaging. Um, you don't want that, okay? That's uh, specific to your eyes. Diabetic nephropathy causes microalbuminuria, which refers to the presence of the blood protein albumin in the urine. Shouldn't be using losing albumin um, at in large amounts in your urine. Decreased urine production can result as can result due to kidney damage that associated with diabetes. As a result of decreased urine production, there's an increase in the accumulation of nitrogenous waste. It just gets worse, doesn't it? Diabetic neuropathy is a chronic complication of diabetes, and diabetic neuropathy refers to damage to the nerves from having diabetes mellitus. Picture here on the right illustrates how blood vessels or poor circulation can contribute to damage to the protective sheet and eventually disappearance of the protective sheaths that cover your nerve cells. The extent to which nerves are damaged are dependent on the severity and duration of hyperglycemia. Symptoms of diabetic neuropathy may include deep pain or burning in the legs and feet, weakness of the arms and legs, numbness and tingling of the hands, and loss of sensation that may cause you to not notice foot wounds. These foot wounds can turn into amputations, and they do in a lot of people with diabetes. Diabetic neuropathy occurs in about 50% of diabetes cases. Diabetes mellitus requires lifelong treatment and monitoring. You can put type 2 diabetes into remission. Type 1 diabetes is something that has no cure yet. yet. Um, so uh, you have to treat it with insulin lifelong. It requires you to balance meals, medication, and physical activity. In order to keep, maintain good glycemic control, um, it is necessary to monitor and adjust as needed. The ultimate treatment goals in diabetes, or goal is to maintain blood glucose levels within a desirable range in order to prevent or reduce the risk of complications. We also want the maintenance of healthy blood lipid concentrations, the control of blood, blood pressure, and the management of weight. Diabetes education is beneficial um, in order to teach people how to plan meals, how to administer medication, how to monitor blood glucose, and manage weight. There are two types of therapies for type 1 diabetes, our autoimmune condition. Conventional th therapy and intensive therapy. It, these two differ in the amount or the extent to which blood glucose is monitored, the amount of insulin that is given, and there are advantages and disadvantages to each. Conventional therapy is advantageous in that it results in fewer incidents of severe hypoglycemia and also less weight gain than with intensive therapy. Recall that the hormone insulin signals the, body's, the body to store carbohydrate and fat. Disadvantages of conventional therapy include the more rapid progression of retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Intensive therapy is advantageous in that it delays the progression of retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. 
but there is a two-fold to three-fold increase in severe hypoglycemia. You gotta be careful with that. In evaluating diabetes treatment, it's important to monitor glycemic status with self-monitoring of blood glucose with AccuChecks, or there's um, a new system called from Freestyle. Commercials playing all the time. Continuous glucose monitoring is imperative. In terms of long-term glycemic control, the HbA1c is useful in that it reflects glycemic control over the preceding two to three months. It gives you a percentage of hemoglobin that is bound to glucose. There's another test called the fructosamine test, which measures the non-enzymatic glycation of serum proteins to determine glycemic control over the preceding two to three weeks. In the evaluation of diabetes treatment, monitoring for long-term complications is imperative. Routine checks should be done for urinary proteins, annual lipids should be checked, and blood pressure should be monitored. Ketone testing can detect ketoacidosis and it's most useful for type 1 diabetes or gestational diabetes. From a nutrition standpoint, the dietary recommendations for diabetes aim to improve glycemic control. In other words, keep your blood sugar within the required range. Slow the progression of diabetic complications like neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy. There are recommendations for intakes of the macronutrients protein, carbohydrates, and fat. The actual percent of calorie distribution will ultimately depend on food preferences and metabolic factors. And it is of the utmost importance to maintain a consistent day-to-day -day carbohydrate intake. Dietary recommendations for total carbohydrate intake are based on a person's metabolic needs, the type of insulin or other medications that they're on, and individual preferences. Ideally, a person should work with a dietitian to help get their diet optimal. Don't torture yourself with things that you don't like. Um, if you don't like any healthy foods, you're going to have to have a little work to do. Um, check out the rule of three in your textbook. If it's not in this edition, go to Google and Google dietary rule of three. The glycemic index refers to a set of values that rank foods according to how quickly and how long your blood sugars are elevated after consuming that food. Low glycemic index foods are foods that do not cause your blood sugar to rise rapidly. If you choose wheat bread and brown rice over Coca-Cola and other concentrated sweets, it means you are choosing lower glycemic foods. Lower glycemic foods may modestly help improve glycemic control. Minimize added sugars. 
the Dietary Reference Intake Committee recommends that total added sugars make up less than 10% of your daily calorie intake. Whole grains and fiber can be used to stabilize blood sugars. By reducing added sugar intake, increasing fiber, um, you are already ahead. In terms of dietary fat, choose fats that are healthy. Trans fats are a type of fat that increase your bad cholesterol and decrease your good cholesterol. So it should be minimized. In fact, try to include zero grams of trans fat in your diet. Saturated fat should be less than 10% of your total kilocalories. For those on a 2,000 calorie diet, that's less than about 16 grams of saturated fat, or, or the average size of one hot dog wiener. Make sure you're getting omega-3s from fatty fish or plants like flaxseed. And the recommendation for cholesterol intake is to consume less than 300 milligrams daily in order to help control blood lipids. Um, all of this is necessary uh, from a nutrition standpoint due to the flow chart where we talked about how insulin insufficiency causes all of the various metabolic complications. So take a look back at that picture and you will see the importance of this. Protein recommendations are similar to that of the general population. High intakes of proteins may cause kidney function uh, loss in people who have kidney damage. There are some groups who should avoid alcohol altogether. Uh, for those who drink, for women, it is recommended that you consume no more than one drink per day. And men consume no more than two drinks per day. There have been a number of studies that come, come, have come out recently that associate alcohol consumption, any level of consumption among women, with an increased risk of breast cancer. So um, do some research yourself. If you haven't used scholar.google.com, take a look at it. It provides you with peer-reviewed websites where you can have access to some full text articles so you can see in detail what the studies that you may have read about or heard on the news um, actually mean. Supplements are not currently recommended for managing diabetes. That doesn't mean in the future that they won't be recommended. The American Diabetes Association, I think I forgot to mention, recommends that a minimum of 130 grams of carbohydrate be consumed daily, most if not all from whole grain sources. What are the benefits of moderate weight loss for overweight or obese patients and type 2 diabetes? There are a number of meal planning strategies like Carbohydrate counting, consulting with a registered dietitian can help a patient learn about their nutrient needs and how best to manage diet. And continuing talking about carbohydrate counting, here's an example of a carbohydrate allowance meal plan for a 2,000 calorie diet. Carbohydrates are divided into 15 gram portions. Every 15 grams of carbohydrate in a food is equal to one portion or one carbohydrate equivalent. You will hear it referred to as a portion or a carbohydrate equivalent or a carbohydrate exchange. So in this particular sample carbohydrate distribution, um, a person is uh, allowed breakfast, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner, and an evening snack. This person is uh, 
allowed to have up to 255 grams of carbohydrate based on the allotment of different carbohydrate equivalents or portions allotted at different meals. So four portions is allotted at breakfast and lunch, two for afternoon snack, five for dinner, and two for evening snack. So if each portion has 15 grams of carbohydrate, then you're allowed 60 grams of carbohydrate at breakfast, 60 grams at lunch, 30 grams for your afternoon snack, 75 grams for dinner, and 30 grams for your evening snack. So you may think that's a lot, but for 2,000 calories, you know, depending on uh, a person's glycemic control, you can go with, you know, less or you can go with a little more. Uh, I like less, um, but don't go under 130 grams per day per the American Diabetes Association and make sure that you are spreading your carbohydrate intake over the day. Don't eat all your carbs in one setting and make sure that you are balancing carbohydrates out by including fat and protein with a meal. There are food lists for diabetes. You can create meal plans for yourself by choosing foods that have specified portions. Take a look at Appendix C and familiarize yourself with carbohydrate counting. There are a number of different insulin preparations. Um, type 1 diabetics require insulin and they are often on a combination of different types of insulin preparations that have different peaks and durations of actions. Um, this is decided by a person's endocrinologist. And an endocrinologist will follow a patient over long term in order to establish baseline and to determine the best combination of insulin preparations to uh, prescribe. The insulin regimen for type 1 diabetes can be conventional or can be intensive. Type 1 diabetes is best management with intensive insulin therapy, which can include, or which does include, multiple daily injections of several types of insulin or the use of an insulin pump, which you do have to interact with, but allows you to have a source of insulin on your body, kind of like, you know, your pancreatic beta cells that's attached to your body or I should say your insulin pump will act as your pancreatic beta cells. In order to learn about your meals and carbohydrate counting, it's recommended that patients keep records of food intake, um, the number of grams of carbohydrate consumed in order to establish a carbon, uh, carbohydrate to insulin ratio. How many insulin units should be administered for every 15 grams of carbohydrate consumed. The honeymoon period is uh, talked about in your chapter in reference to type 1 diabetes. Be familiar with what that is. In type 2 diabetes, some people require insulin. About 30% of patients benefit from insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes because their pancreatic beta cells have gotten exhausted and they're no longer producing the insulin requirement. This produces or creates an insulin insufficiency which sets up a scenario for metabolic derangements. There are different insulin regimens. Um, usually type 2 diabetics um, will require insulin alone or may require insulin with anti-diabetic drugs. The most common complication of insulin treatment is hypoglycemia. 
It can be corrected very easily with immediate ingestion of glucose or glucose containing food. Fasting hyperglycemia is sort of a paradox that can occur after an overnight fast of at least eight hours. Treatment involves the adjustment of dosage or formulation of insulin that's administered in the evening to cover um, those eight hours. There are a number of anti-diabetic drugs that can be offered for type 2 diabetes treatment. There are side effects that are outlined in box 2010 and some of those side effects have nutrition related effects. Physical activity is crucial in the management of diabetes. It can help to improve your glycemic control considerably. It is recommended that people who have diabetes help manage it by participating in at minimum 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, aerobic activity per week over at least three days. Both aerobic exercises and resistance exercise can improve insulin sensitivity of the body's cells. Even going for a walk in the evening after you consume dinner can improve the way your body responds to insulin. It is important that you be evaluated prior to participating in exercise. The purpose of this is to screen for potential problems. You don't want to aggravate any of your condi conditions with certain activities. And the goal of physical activity is to um, maintain lysemic control. There are rules for following, um, for maintaining glycemic control when you are sick. It is important that you monitor your blood glucose and ketone levels several times a day um, while you are sick because you're at risk. You need to continue drugs or insulin as prescribed and adjust doses if the diet is altered or if persistent hyperglycemia develops. It is recommended that your prescribed carbohydrate intake be maintained and consume liquids to prevent dehydration. If a person has a poor appetite, um, a meal replacement that is high in calories and contains balanced carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids can be consumed like glucerna. Certain hormonal changes that occur during stress can make it difficult to maintain glycemic control. Women with gestational diabetes have a greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. And there are a number of health risks for uncontrolled diabetes for the mother and the fetus who are experiencing gestational diabetes. Be familiar with those. I read about them in your text. If you have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes and become pregnant, it is important to maintain glycemic control throughout the pregnancy and even at conception. It will substantially reduce the risk of birth defects and spontaneous abortion. Women who have type 1 diabetes who are pregnant require intensive insulin therapy during pregnancy. Women with type 2 are usually switched to insulin therapy to control blood glucose during pregnancy. It's important for the health of your child and for optimal um, pregnancy health. 
And in pregnancy, just like with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, you need to avoid extremes in blood glucose, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Carbohydrate intakes need to be balanced with insulin treatment and physical therapy to avoid big variations in blood glucose that disrupt your metabolism. What factors are associated with an increased risk of gestational diabetes? For overweight women who become pregnant, a modest reduction in calories, about 30% less than what you need, can drastically improve glycemic control. Reducing carbohydrate intake to 40 to 45 percent of calories, which is considered low, may also improve blood glucose after consuming meals. And restricting carbohydrate to about 30 grams at breakfast may also help glycemic control in gestational diabetes. It is recommended that carbohydrates be spaced throughout the day Regular aerobic activity is important throughout uh, pregnancy unless it's um, contraindicated and your physician tells you that you need bed rest. Aerobic activity in gestational diabetes improves glycemic control. If glycemic control cannot be achieved with diet and exercise, then insulin and anti-diabetic drugs need to be considered and may be ultimately necessary. If you have the 6th edition textbook this semester, you can look on page 579 for the nutrition and practice section which describes the metabolic syndrome. There are diagnostic criteria for the metabolic syndrome on this page and table in P20-1. In order for diagnosis of the metabolic syndrome, three or more of the following abnormalities should be present. Hyperglycemia, abdominal obesity, hypertriglyceridemia, reduced high-density lip lipoprotein cholesterol or hypertension. Any three or more must be present to diagnose metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> Insulin resistance is a huge feature or central feature of the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is related to the development of cardiovascular diseases. It is considered an independent risk factor for the development of diabetes and heart disease. Treatment should include weight loss, modifications to diet that are consistent with um, recommendations for the general population. Physical activity is recommended most days of the week. And medications may be necessary in an effort to control abnormal or alterations in metabolism or um, your triglycerides, your blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, etc. Okay, make sure you read this chapter more than once and um, be able to work through the objectives that are posted in your study guide in Moodle. And please let me know if you have questions.